negotiations, as Alex pointed out, is one of my personal passions. And I've been negotiating now for over 25 years, maybe even longer these days. I'm going to actually, I'll be 51 next week, so you can do the math. Uh, and I've been negotiating with Microsoft for, I don't know, going on 20 years now. I used to work for Microsoft. I was a licensing executive many, many years ago. And um, I basically had to share my knowledge with you. So first of all, great to be here again. I want to say hi, everybody, anybody that's joined that just want to say hello. Um, so we know that uh, you're out there. Uh, please do. As Alex pointed out, I'm the chief negotiation officer and I'm a partner uh, with Sam Expert. Uh, and I wrote a book. Thank you, Alex. Always reminds yeah. <laughs> me uh, a few years ago about specifically about negotiating with Microsoft and sharing again, sharing my knowledge, my know-how with the community um, and with um, experts, licensing experts, managers, CFOs, uh, procurement managers that deal with Microsoft or deal with large enterprise negotiations in general. So thank you, Alex. Uh, yeah, we can move forward. I want, to, I want to really hit the ground running today. We've got quite a bit of um, ground to cover, uh, Alex. So. Okay. We yeah, can we can yeah. basically just you know, we can just start going. Hi everybody, Cheryl, uh, uh, Prash, how you doing? Great to see everybody back uh, uh, on the training. Hi, Cheryl. Yeah. So yeah, Alex, has, uh, Alex has got complete control over me today because he's got the <laughs> he's got he's got the slides. So I have to press a button, a virtual button. Hi Alvaro, Vijay, uh, to get Alex moving. Alex. Let's, uh, let's just let's just jump in straight because I don't want to uh, waste too yeah, much time. Yeah, so then if you can uh, make me smaller and bring up the uh, larger presentation. Absolutely, that's what I'm doing next. Uh, I know people the... love looking at me, but we can make. But then I, <laughs> I can I can I can go small. That's fine. Hi, Jane. Nice to have you aboard. So I want to start really with the basics, and then we're going to move forward uh, with actually how to construct the negotiation. So I'm starting from the base. And I'll go all the way to um, the advanced stuff uh, regarding negotiation. So let's start with the negotiation framework. So there's basically five, five stages. This is, this is a methodology that's based on my proprietary design called Resilient Negotiator. Anybody wants to join, I've got a course that started last week specifically on negotiations. So just check out my LinkedIn channel and you'll see it there. So this is coming from there. So you're getting really the entire overview, a professional view of how to stage your negotiations. So there's five stages, background and research, the negotiation envelope, execution plan, execution, 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 but you can't execute without having a good plan. It just doesn't work. The bargaining stage, and how do you actually close and expand and work from there to the next stage? Now let's start, let's move forward and let's start with the background and research um, and we'll progress as we move forward. So in the background and research stage, we're basically looking at collecting and analyzing data. So what do I mean in the Microsoft um, 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 framework about data? So data is your licenses and there are two types of information basically or sets of information that you need. And Alex has been speaking about this throughout his training. And that is your, on one hand, your entitlements, what you own, what you've purchased over the years, and that you can find in your Microsoft licensing statement, your MLS, or go through the Microsoft volume licensing site, or go to your reseller, your LSP, or directly to Microsoft, depending on your site. So you need your entitlements. You can't start getting to a negotiation without understanding everything that you have. In addition, on the other side, not in addition, but the other side of your entitlement is what's installed, your install base. You need to go out there and collect data regarding installations. What software have you got installed? Where is it installed? What are the licensing metrics? You need to take that together with your entitlements and you produce a licensing positioning document, an ELP, Effective Licensing Positioning Document. What that gives you, it gives you your licensing status. That is your background information. 
your, your basic Microsoft background information. You cannot start a negotiation. Oh, you can, of course. I wouldn't recommend it without having that knowledge of what is your up-to-date licensing um, um, position, number one. Number two is company intel. So what is company intel? Company intel is both your internal company intel, meaning what's going on with the relationship with Microsoft? What projects are going on? Is R&D involved with Microsoft? Are there strategic discussions going on with executive uh, level uh, management that you're not aware of? Are there other types of relationships? Do you have a unified support agreement with Microsoft or a, what was used to call what we used to call a premier support agreement? Maybe there are isolated Azure um, uh, initiatives. You need to bring in that company Intel information. You need to understand if the relationship with Microsoft is a good relationship, a bad relationship. Gather all that information. Market standards and benchmark. You need to go out, speak to your peers, or speak to IDC or to Gartner or to research companies or SAM consultants. And you need to understand what are the best practices today regarding Microsoft licensing, discounts, and um, services and benefits. You need to know what's going on in the market. Otherwise, you're actually entering a negotiation room blindfolded and you're going to be walking around and you're never going to know if you've actually reached your goal, uh, if it's best practice or if it's not best practice, really key. And part of that market standard, if I take one step back to um, company Intel, is you need to gather the information about your previous agreement with Microsoft or your current agreement that's coming to an end. Have a look at what your current or previous benefits were. What discount level you received? Did you receive any incentive funds, any uh, specific uh, uh, premier or unified support um, benefits? You really, really need to collect the data so you know what your benchmark, your internal benchmark is, and then you go out to the marketplace and you get your external benchmarking information. Super important. I also um, really encourage you to speak to your peers, um, people in your market. Go onto LinkedIn. There are plenty of licensing forums. There's the Microsoft licensing forum. There's, 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 there's Alex's YouTube channel. Ask questions. Ask people. You'll be surprised how willing people are to share their data with you. And then that's benchmark information as well. Decision makers and shadow negotiators, part of that background and research process, you need to understand what's going on within Microsoft and within your own company. So when I'm talking about decision makers and shadow negotiators, who are the decision makers on Microsoft side? It's not going to be your account manager. Or if you're dealing with your LSP, it's not your LSP. It's the people behind your LSP. And that's Microsoft. So who are they dealing with? You need to understand, you need to get names, names, positions, uh, roles, responsibilities, collect that data. The larger your agreement is, and you know, if you're a, a, a company that's over, you know, not huge, but over 5,000 seats, you've got negotiation power, you've got leverage, you've got somebody to talk to within Microsoft. You need to understand who the decision makers are. If you're a smaller Smaller than 5,000 and, and even below, again, depending on your market. Each market, Microsoft has, different, has a different type of approach to the size of the organization. You need to speak to your LSP and understand from your LSP who's in the back end of Microsoft and how can you potentially influence them. So there's a lot of work that you have to get done prior to engaging with Microsoft. We'll talk about the timeline in a minute. Alex, let's move forward. So I... I mentioned the negotiation envelope. What is in a negotiation envelope? So negotiation envelope, ultimately, it's the playing ground. So in every game, if it's um, football for the Americans, soccer in Europe, uh, if it's rugby, or if it's cricket, or uh, baseball, or whatever you name it, there's a field. And there are rules to the field. There's goals, and there's basically uh, the margins of where you can play. And if you go out the margins, the game's going to stop. It's exactly the same with a negotiation. There's a field within that field that you can actually negotiate. That's your zone of possible agreement. Outside that field, 
you're actually not paying in the, in the negotiation field. You want something, Microsoft's proposing something, and you're not even talking the same language. Maybe Microsoft's pro um, 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 providing a Microsoft uh, 365 E5 proposal, and you actually only need E3. And they come in and they're very enthusiastic and they're providing you with uh, uh, best practice discounts, but you're only on E3. So you're not even in the ballpark. You're not in the ZOPA. You're not in the zone of possible agreement. So you need to make sure that when you set down your MDO, MDO stands for most desirable outcome. What is your stretch goal? What's your LDO, least desirable outcome? What's the worst scenario that you're willing to walk um, um, away from the negotiation table with, with a contract? So you basically need to understand what's your um, most desirable outcome, what's your least desirable outcome. Write it down. Whatever I'm telling you now has to be put down in writing. Don't just leave it in your head. Write it down. Put down your stretch goals. Put down your least desirable outcome. This all needs to be well, well art articulated afterwards internally to your organization and to Microsoft. And, and you need to put yourself in Microsoft's shoes and try and figure out what are they expecting from this new agreement? What are their goals? What's their stretch goal, MDO? What's their least desirable outcome but they're willing to live with? That's the LDO. And of course, you want to figure out what their LDO is. Because once you understand what the LDO is, okay, now, now you've got a range to negotiate in. And then there's a um, there's your BATNA. And I'm going like this because BATNA is your best alternative to negotiated agreement. That's what's your alternative. What's Microsoft's alternative and what's your alternative? It's not a red line, so to say. It, it means just say you don't take Microsoft 365 E5 with all the latest and greatest security features. What's your alternative? Palo Alto or another solution? What have you got currently in your um, organization? What can you potentially introduce as an alternative? If you are on Office 365 or, and, um, and you've just purchased a new company, and that company is actually your size, big merger. And uh, you purchase a company the same size as you, but they're coming in with G Suite. So maybe your BATNA is to move to G Suite and not to stay on Office 365. That, of course, is leverage when you have a discussion with Microsoft. You can bring that in as leverage. Oh, we've just merged. We've just purchased a company. They've got G Suite. We haven't yet taken a decision if you want to continue with G Suite with uh, their platform or stay with 365. Okay, we've got an interesting discussion going on. So you need to bring to the table as much information as possible. You need to have a very clear BATNA on very specific issues. You need to have an MDO, an LDO, and you need to put yourself in Microsoft's shoes to understand what they are expecting from this negotiation. Well, we all know today what they're expecting. It's not a secret, 365E5, okay? That is the obvious. That's where they compensated. We'll talk about pricing, how Microsoft is compensated in a few minutes. Let's move on. So let's talk about the execution plan. So once you basically understand, you've gathered your information, and you know what your stretch goal is and your least desirable goal, and you've put that down, you've written it down, now you need to start putting together a execution plan. What is the bargaining stage going to look like? And there are, there's a number of steps that you need to go through and data that you need to just sit down, maybe brainstorm with various people in your organization. So first of all, I always say think like an explorer. Look for opportunities. Look for a leverage point that you can bring to the table. It really needs to be, you need to maybe even think out of the box. What can you bring uh, in regard to Azure? Have you got maybe... Um, a project with um, Power Apps that you can maybe utilize. And Microsoft really wants Power Apps these days. Maybe you are planning to uh, move away from a CRM platform and move to Dynamics for whatever kind of application development and so on and so on. Think out of the box. Write down all of those leverage points. Create a checklist of everything that you've collected. C uh, define your objectives that we spoke about, the MDO, LDO, and Microsoft's. I, what I like to do, I just 
have a simple table uh, at the top, MDO, LDO, Microsoft, myself, or the company that I'm representing at that time. And I start putting down numbers and I put down percentage points and I put down actual figures and Azure spend and AWS spend and maybe Google spend, um, um, incentives that I want to receive, compensation, maybe in, in um, um, partner incentive funds and so on. And I make a long list. I put down my legal requirements as well because there's always the legal side of negotiating uh, an enterprise agreement. So you put everything down and then you put, okay, what is Microsoft going to expect? I don't want to be surprised. I want to, I want to be prepared. And then it's not only about having very clear objectives. Objectives are not enough. You need to understand what are the commercial interests or the interests behind the goals. What are interests? Interest is actually what drives us. Okay, We're not driven by a goal. A goal is going to help us get from A to B. It's going to push us up that hill, give us motivation. Oh, we want to go up. We want to have a clear set goal. We want it to be achievable, but we want it to be a high goal, something that we can um, 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 work, work for, but we can actually attain. Interests are what are behind the goal. So for example, let's think about the interests of a Microsoft account manager or a Microsoft team. What kind of interest can, can we think about? You know, I'm going to give you a minute if you want to just participate. What kind of interest do you think Microsoft or the Microsoft account manager might have in your next renewal? I'm going to give you one minute. Just put down whatever comes to mind in the chat box. And let's have a discussion about interest because they are super, super important to the outcome of the negotiation. Think about the interest of maybe of your boss. Think about the interest of Microsoft's account manager's uh, CEO or GM. Do you want to share something with us? Just feel free. One word, two words. If not, I'll jump in. I've got a lot to say about it. I'm going to give you one minute. Alex, why is the uh, slide flickering? Is that on my side or is it on your side? Alex is quiet. Okay, I'm going to help you out. Yeah, yeah, I, I switched myself off. The slides are flickering on my side. It's um, uh, just a new settings that I, I used today. Unfortunately, I can't change it. So uh, we have oh. to bear with them flickering. Okay, don't worry. I'm just wondering if, if I was having any any uh, glitches on my side. Okay, so yeah. first of all, uh, Cheryl, thank you. Yes, MS wants to upsell. MS wants to upsell, but let's, I want to, this is really important. They want to upsell, that's a target. Why do they want to upsell? The reason they want to upsell is because they have an internal scorecard. And in that scorecard, the account manager has moved your customer from E3 to E5. You move him from E3 to E5, you get a bonus. The interest is money, a big bonus. That's one interest that's driving the account manager. Another interest is maybe there's a big promotion. A few years ago, I concluded a deal with a, a large multinational. Uh, and that mul a large multinational, uh, 100 company, manager of that account is for a, a global account director, very high level. He's, except for his monetary compensation, behind the success of the deal that he closed, he actually received a very, very big promotion. So he was compensated the, his interest behind closing that deal with very specific targets was a promotion, moving away from that company into a very, very strategic management role. That's an interest. Maybe another interest is, <clears throat> sorry, the overall subsidiary's interest. So if it's a very big contract, The success of that contract is aggregated all the way to the top of the subsidiary or the region. So there could be interests, not only of the account manager, but the success of the general manager. He has an interest for you to succeed so he can maybe get best, um, best region of the year award, or he gets an overall compensation because that deal 
meets his personal scorecard and his personal interest. So those are interests that are behind the actual goals. The way that you can figure out what those interests are is to actually speak to your account manager or to your LSP or to your technical contact within Microsoft. Have a friendly conversation. Try and figure out how many accounts does your account manager have? Is this the last account that he needs to close to make his numbers for the year? How many years has he been in this position? Two, three, five years? Is he new to his position? Does he have to prove himself? So there are ways to understand what the interests are. And once you understand the interests, it's actually easier to push the right buttons. Now you need to separate personal interests from corporate interests. We were talking about success of a personal interest of uh, your account manager or his peers and the company's interest of meeting um, specific budget restraints or meeting um, analyst uh, expectations. So again, separate personal and uh, corporate interests and look at your interests. You've got your internal interests as well. And then part of the execution plan is designing a game plan. So what is going to be your game plan? A game plan, plan we'll talk about it in a few minutes. There are various plan games that you can play. Are you going to play, uh, basically, are you going to use um, relationship leverage and play that game? Oh, we are a big company. We are very important to you. We've got strategic projects coming. Is that the game you want to play? Do you want to play the game? Oh, if we don't sign a contract with you, we out the door with security. You need to figure out what the game is or multiple games and you need to play that game well. Okay, let's move on. So once we understand and we've gone through the basics, how do we structure this plan? How do we actually start off? You need to know that the odds are not in your favor. They're not. And it's actually over the last few years, it's actually stacked against you even more than it was previously. So if you're looking at Microsoft, Microsoft has got the leverage because they have a complete negotiation team. They have an account manager. They have the business desk. They have licensing executives. They have um, commercial decision makers and tons of experience. Their prices are increasing coming March. That's huge leverage in you. Huge pressure. Azure is growing substantially, and we all know that. Commitments are growing. You are embedded. You can't really change um, supplies that easily as maybe we thought in the cloud that you can go from AWS to Azure, from Azure to Google. Not exactly. We know that that's much more complicated. And once you committed, you committed. And the 365 subscription, that's a honey trap. Once you in, to 365, you're in for life. You haven't got that, oh, I'm not going to renew software assurance game that we used to play three, four, five years ago. You're going to stay with our perpetual licenses for four or five years. That's leverage. We've lost that. It's out the door. And Microsoft does this for a living every single day, thousands of times throughout the company. And you do it once every three years. You're not expected to have this knowledge that they have. And of course, you're managing multiple vendors. How can you understand the complexity of Microsoft licensing the, their legal terms and conditions and their pricing metrics when you've got Adobe and you've got SAP and IBM and maybe 10 dozen other suppliers that you're dealing with? You just can't do it. And security, security, security. Microsoft has done a fantastic job. And I, dare, I really take my hat off to them as a company from a technology perspective, they've offered fantastic bundles that everything just integrates really well into the enterprise environment. But again, you locked in. So the odds are not in your favor. That means there's even more emphasis on your preparation stage and digging and looking for that information that's gonna provide you with that additional leverage that's going to be unique to your negotiation 
so you can get better results. So what are the stages in the negotiation? I like to look at it as a T minus 12 month process. And I know who wants to start preparing for negotiation 12 months before the renewal. You've got a million other things to do, but you know what you have to. If you're a large organization, you need to prepare a year in, a, a year in advance. And where do you start? You start with budget. You need to figure out what your budget is and how do you, how do I prepare for a budget when I'm asked to with, with a customer? I first look at what the current spend is. I ask questions like, okay, what are your Azure plans? What are your 365 plans? What are your merger and acquisition plans? Diverse teachers, layoffs. Where are you going? What, what um, a strategic projects do you have on the table with Microsoft? I ask a lot of questions. I take all that, I add on top of the current budget, I never go down, sorry. That's just the way it works, don't expect to go down. And I start accumulating and then I come up with a budget. The budget sets the tone internally and it helps me set the right expectations for the stretch goal and for the least desirable outcome. So I'm already doing that next step of preparation and I'm starting to align my team. I'm getting my manager involved or I get the managers involved. I work as a consultant. Sorry, I'm so embedded with customers sometimes that, that, that I see myself part of that personal team and I've been doing it for so many years. So we align the team. We get legal, we get finance, we get the technical team, we get the software asset management guys uh, or uh, ladies on board and we get our managers and we get the managers and the decision makers. The larger the deal, the higher it's going to be. You need to understand, if you're new to your organization, what's the sign-off process? Will you need to go to the board? How long is it going to take to get the board to sign off on this contract? Is it going to take a month, two months, three months? Who's going to sign the contract? Who do you need? Whose approval do you need? Get that information T-12. That takes a while. That can take two, three months easy in a large organization. T-8. Data analysis. We spoke about data analysis. Data analysis takes and can take anywhere between three to six months. Three months at minimum, at minimum, and six months, yeah, that's what it takes, especially for large organizations. So you need to start working and getting everything prepared. T minus six, hopefully you've got everything prepared. T minus six, T minus five. You need to start doing some financial analysis. You need to understand, okay, this is my set of entitlements. This is my gap. What do I need for my true up? Alex spoke about true up, um, your end of the year uh, compliance review, internal compliance review. What do you need to add onto your contract? You need to get data from your previous agreement, from your future agreement, ask your LSP for pricing. Don't run to Microsoft or don't ask for a quote yet. Do the analysis by yourself. You can do it. It's not... Uh, rocket science, guys. It's not rocket science. Put together the negotiation plan that we discussed. And then put together the execution plan and everything I spoke about. And then at minimum, okay, at minimum T minus three months, you hit negotiations. When I mean you hit negotiations, you're sitting in the negotiation room and negotiating. That's at minimum. I'd like to start before, but Reality is reality as we all know. So <clears throat> T minus three and always leave time, contingency time to get the actual agreements signed. Okay, so now we've gone through the framework. We understand what we need to get ready for the negotiations. We understand the timeline and Hopefully you've been part of the training so you know how to do a lot of what I've just discussed internally or how to engage the right people within your organization and collect the data and do the analysis and you get your understanding of your Microsoft metrics. Now, 2022 is coming. And I'm talking about 2022 because it's around, it's really around the corner. So let's understand what we are up against and what you need to prepare for your next round of negotiations. This is hardcore preparation. 
This is real life information that we've seen over the last year and over the last 10 years. Consolidated. So actually, so you can actually take this to the table. So we're going through, so we've got um, billing, uh, we've got direct billing by Microsoft, the new commerce experience. We're going to talk about each one. The CSP, uh, monthly CSP plans, EA CSPs, the game's changing. Uh, LSPs, what can we use as leverage with the LSPs? Discount policy, talk about what's happening with discount in the EAs, declining discount tactics. Potentially, the EA um, step of 2,400 plus PCs is, uh, sorry, the 500 plus to enter an EA is potentially might change and the next step might be 2400. We're hearing rumors, okay? How do we prepare for that? Let's talk about unified support for those of you that are in large organizations, Microsoft's internal sales compensation, uh, divide and conquer tactic that Microsoft uses in large organizations, how Microsoft pushes sneaky products, what's their tactic? Again, sorry, there's a, um, um, Spelling uh, error in, in number 14, we'll get to that. And March 2022, price increases are coming. What can you do to mitigate that? Let's move on. Okay. So first of all, let's talk about direct. Microsoft, today with the new Microsoft Customer Agreement, MCA, that uh, Alex, I think, spoke about. And if not, please look at one of the previous videos to understand what the Microsoft Customer Agreement is all about. Basically, it opens up an option for Microsoft to build customers directly without a partner. That's big news, especially for large organizations. So please look out for that. It might be an option for you. You might want to interact directly with Microsoft. Then you're going to have a direct negotiation with Microsoft. That's huge. That's huge. Figure out, ask questions, talk to us, talk to your LSP, see if you are entitled to that. Um, one of the caveats to the direct billing is Microsoft's got a set 30 day payment term where with your LSP, you can negotiate net plus 30, net plus 60 or whatever, wherever you are in the world. And the audit clause is standard 30 day audit clause. We spoke about audit clauses um, two weeks ago in the session. You can review that on our YouTube channel. We spoke, we went into depth about audits and how to mitigate audits, how to manage audits. So look at your audit clause. So the new commerce experience, again, this is changing in March. It's, it's, it's basically Microsoft has new, um, new acronyms and new way of dealing with customers and partners. So they have a breadth motion, an enterprise motion, and a self-service um, motion. Basically, what Microsoft is, 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 is doing, they are consolidating their partner efforts and moving a lot of their responsibilities that they have had directly with customers to partners. So partners are taking on themselves a huge responsible well, opportunity responsibility of engaging with customers. And if everything was very specific, EA was specific, select, plus, MPSA, open CSP, everything was a specific channel, Microsoft's channels are changing. So you're going to see much, you're going to see many more CSP partners, a huge number. CSPs are going to be competing with LSPs. So you're going to see instances where Microsoft is not discounting EAs like they used to, meaning a CSP contract can be very lucrative. So if you're an EA customer of 700, 1,000 PCs or 1,000 users, and Microsoft doesn't want to introduce discount because protocol for, for discounts has changed, it's worthwhile introducing a CSP partner and saying, hey, can you please provide me a quote? I might be under an EA, but let's see what you can offer. The CSP model is different than the EA model from a compensation perspective. You might be surprised and your CSP partner can provide you a better price quote than your LSP did for your EA. We're seeing that as well. So that's new competition. That is the essence of the new commerce experience from a commercial perspective. And that's how you need to view it. Thank you. 
Okay, so I touched on the CSP negotiation shift, increased um, competition. If you're a multinational company, try and get, um, don't try, get um, price quotes from multiple CSP partners around the globe and ask for value added services. Microsoft partners are required to provide you with value added services. And that is part of your responsibility from a commercial perspective to go out there and get multiple proposals from multiple partners for CSP. Pricing will fluctuate and they will change. That is changing the negotiation paradigm as well. Your responsibility, nobody will do it for you. Another thing that's changing that you need to be aware of when you renegotiate your CSP or you're re-entering into a CSP agreement is that previously CSP monthly pricing was a default. You were getting very, very good pricing and you were paying on a monthly basis. And you were adjusting your quantities on a monthly basis. So with the new motion coming in March, the monthly pricing is going to go up by 20%. That's huge. Huge, huge price increase. That's on top of other price increases that are coming. We've calculated, Alex, correct me if I'm wrong, over 40% potential price increase just for monthly CSP. So maybe you want to enter into an EA if you're large enough. Maybe. Maybe you want to renegotiate or enter into a new CSP now for the long term before the pricing um, changes in March. That's a huge step that you need to make now, not in March. Alex, do you want to add anything? Yeah, you're absolutely correct, Daryl. It's, uh, it's on average at 40%. The biggest price increase is on the three because the three goes up by 20. Uh, we have a slight, the, the slight number, number 15 in this series. Yeah. But it goes up by 25%. So imagine you have 25% on top of that. And if you want to retain your flexibility, you would have to also pay on top of that 20% premium. So those who are on the three are up to a big shock, uh, which is mitigatable to an extent, but to you can't, extent. can't avoid it entirely mm -hmm. so you need to be clever about it okay thanks alex okay moving on so we're going to see that there's going to be a big motion towards three-year commitments for csps we know that microsoft is pushing towards that um, it's better negotiation between you and your reseller if they want a three-year commitment and it's good for their business and they compensate it for that. Negotiate better pricing. Don't let them say, no, this is set pricing. Push back and get alternative pricing as well. And stay focused on your business needs and not on your licensing needs. That's always. So when I'm saying business needs, what kind of services do you need? Uh, what kind of support do you need? Again, that's a paradigm change in the way that we've been negotiating years before. So I pointed out that LSPs have new competition and those new competition, that, that, that new competition is CSPs. Microsoft has gone all out with introducing CSP partners. It's hurting LSPs tremendously. Remember that we've discussed that. Okay, so discounting. So that's huge. Everybody asks us, okay, what are the discounts? What can we expect? So we can tell you what we expect. And again, it, it differs between regions and verticals and size of organization and product mix. So whatever I'm saying now, I need to really put a caveat and say it depends because there are so many um, variables, but we want to share with you some benchmarking, average numbers, just so you know where you are, because otherwise you close in your own office or, or your own world and you don't really know what's going on in, with, with, within the market. So uh, average discounts have really dropped. Um, and they've dropped, I would say, um, on average by a, a minimum of 4 to 8%. We've actually seen it go down more for E3. And... Discount, if we were seeing average discounts of 20, 25% and sometimes higher, 
the average discounts are down to 15% and higher for larger organizations. So it's a huge double digit almost shift in discounts. Not as easy to get discounts anymore. E3 is not strategic. If you don't bring in security products or you don't have other leverage and you need to really think about it, it's going to be tough to bring in higher discounts. So be aware of that. Prepare for that also in your budget and with your product mix. And when you enter in, into negotiations, this will help you put together your stretch goals and your least desirable goals overall. But don't be intimidated by the changes. Be aware. It just hires the bar of negotiation. And it's going to push your negotiation capabilities even higher. But we all like challenges. And this is about Microsoft challenges. <clears throat> so something that we wanted to share with you, this is relevant for large organizations. I'm, I'm talking very large organizations, uh, 50,000 plus, where Microsoft introduced declining discounts. So you might start off with a 40% discount for the first year, and then it goes down to 35 or 30, and then 25, 20, again, starts declining. The idea behind that is, so to say, help you introduce E5 or other security or other platforms into the organization at a higher discount. But what it does, it sets you up for your exit into your next agreement with a very low starting point for your negotiations. So if it's a declining discount and it ends up at 20% and you started at 40, your next negotiation is going to start off at 20, not at 40, at 20. And you need to prepare for that. I don't like declining discounts. I like an average set discount. Very predictable. Keep that in mind. Watch out for that. So this is a rumor coming. Keep it in mind. We can't confirm it. We will confirm it once we know about it, that the EA might only be available for use for 24 plus users. It will come. We're not sure if it's going to be coming next year or maybe later. It's coming. Be prepared. Be aware. If you're potentially going to be affected, <coughs> drop us a note. Maybe we can help you mitigate that. So unified support just for you uh, out there that are still in the premier support type of context where it's a fixed price. The unified support is linked to your overall um, Azure and EA spend. So the more you spend on your EA and the more you spend on your um, Azure, the more you're going to be paying on your unified support. So even if you're not consuming more support or you're not utilizing uh, or opening up additional support tickets, your price is going to increase. So I've seen contracts go from around one, $1.2 million per year, ending up after three, four years at four or five million. And they actually, when they look at the tickets and what they've used, 10, 15% difference from where they started, but they're paying three, four, five times more. There are ways to um, mitigate that. There are alternative services to the Microsoft Unified support. Again, there are alternatives. There are ways to mitigate it. Bring in a competitor. Uh, maybe drop Unified completely. Ask for detailed reports from Microsoft. They won't be inclined to give you detailed, in-depth reports about the number of tickets, how long it took to resolve, the level of um, severity, and what kind of effort went into it. Push them, push them, push them, because you need that data in order to negotiate. If you don't have the data, you can't negotiate. If you don't have leverage through an alternative supplier, you, you're not going to get a better price. It's up to you to decide if you want to continue paying increased costs for your unified support or you want to stop it now. So Microsoft's internal compensation um, uh, model has changed. Very important for you to understand. Huge. Because this is the interest behind the scenes. Microsoft account managers are no longer it's been a, a while now. They're not compensated on on-premise licenses. They even, I would say that they are hardly even compensated on E3. Everything is about E5. Um, 
that's where their bonuses are. Remember that. Otherwise, it's not interesting to them. It's interesting, but it's less interesting. And Azure consumption, it's not Azure commitment. It's not what you are committing. It's what you are consuming. So you can actually push. Potentially, it's in the interests interest of your account team for you to consume Azure. How do you make it their interest and, how, and, and what can you get in return? Ask for incentive funds. I want $50,000. I want $100,000 on a large Azure commitment so I can rapidly start consuming it because I need additional services. I need a partner to help me. So you're going to get $50,000 because it's in their interest. And that's big money. So that's why I, I come back to interest and what you can get out of the deal that's not only a discount. There are so many different attributes that you can get from the contract that make the overall package much, much more beneficial for you than just, okay, I want a 16% discount, I want a 17% discount. Introduce new areas of services and, and consumption into the metric. Another key thing. Do you know what? I've got a slide about that. Let's continue. Sorry. So this slide, divide and conquer. Microsoft is doing this everywhere. They sign an enterprise agreement with one group. And then basically they like move aside. Okay, EA is signed. Fantastic. We've got that done. And then they start pushing Azure with various groups throughout the company. And it's a separate negotiation for Azure. It's not linked to your EA spend. It's a different discussion. And they're not even, they might not even be having it with the same people in your organization. So you've lost the benefit of the entire leverage of your commercial capabilities. So you might have a $10 million EA or $5 million EA and a $20 million Azure contract. Why don't you use that new Azure commitment to maybe get a 10, 15, 20% reduction on your EA? And what about the unified support? So our recommendation is to have one negotiation motion. Again, a one negotiation motion with Microsoft, combining EA, Azure, support. Not one, then a second one, and then a third one. They don't like it. They will say, we can't do it. It's different teams. Do you know what? If you're large enough and you're strong enough and you're strategic enough to that specific negotiation team, not to Microsoft as Microsoft that's doing $30, $40 billion turnover a, a quarter. I'm talking about that specific account team. You're always dealing with people. Remember that. You are not only dealing with a huge company. You are dealing with a specific individual and that specific individual's team. And they have specific interests. And those interests are bonuses and promotions and paying off the mortgage or getting through a tough divorce or buying a new car. They need you. Don't forget that. Use the one negotiation motion because that is huge. That is you changing the paradigm um, um, uh, direction of what I showed you at the beginning where Microsoft is all the way up there and you're going down. You need to try, bring it to a, you need to try and le level out the playing field. Super, super important. So what is the value gap and really what does it mean for you? So Microsoft is increasing prices of E3 and um, individual components coming March. What they are doing is they are closing the value gap. They're basically saying, well, if you take E3 and one, two products for security, it's going to cost you like E5. So why don't you just take E5? E5 is not going up, not by choice, not by chance. This is a strategically well thought out decision. Nothing is taken lightly within Microsoft. 
So don't ask yourself one question. Oh, well, the price difference is really small. I'll just take E5. No. What does it mean to you in the long run? Do you really need those features? Do you want this to sit as shelfware? And then when, there, then when E5 increases, the price will increase. I can, you know what? I can take a bet with anybody that in the next 12 to 18 months, E5 is going to go up. And then what? Back when you signed the agreement, there was a small difference. Now when you're going to renew it, there's going to be a huge difference and you're still not using that, those additional features. So you've got a huge amount of shelfware, you haven't implemented it, and you're about to pay 20-30% more on your renewal. So it's not only about the current price and the current value gap, it's about the long-term value gap. It's about the long-term pricing strategy. Don't sell the long term for the short term. It's a bad trade off. So, sneaky product uh, tactics, I actually heard of one lately, and that's Power Apps. So, uh, I spoke to a customer, um, much larger picture to this, but a small side of this was that uh, Microsoft is trying to push Power Apps. So they are providing Power Apps. Oh, Mr. Customer, please pay for Power Apps, $20,000, $30,000. And we'll provide you $20,000, $30,000 back worth of services. So basically the customer is saying, oh, it's costing me zero, nothing. Paying for the licenses, getting the services, I've got to implement it. Whoa, what's going to happen when you need to actually pay for those licenses in 12 months' time? Are you going to get discounts? Are you going to get that return, that uh, 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 same level of um, uh, reinvestment? Are you going to get that 30 or 40 or 50% discount you got when you introduced it? Maybe you should get that in advance in writing. So maybe get Microsoft to commit to, oh, I'm introducing Power BI or Power Apps or whatever. The, spe the special discount is going to apply for the next six years. Five years, three years. Don't sell today for tomorrow. And this is what we pointed out and what Alex pointed out. This is huge. To my opinion, this is the biggest paradigm change in the negotiations that's happened in many years. 365, E1, E3, various components are going up. Anywhere from 20%, from sorry, 8.6% to 25% on E1. This is huge. This is in addition to price increases on your monthly cost for CSP. So your CSP monthly cost is going to go up. Your price per unit is going to go up. Prepare yourself for 40% on average price increases on your baseline. Huge. Huge stuff. The way to mitigate it, if you've got a renewal coming up in June, July of next year, please renegotiate in January. Get the agreement signed by the end of February before the price increase. You need to start working on it, otherwise you're going to be surprised. And your budget is going to go all the way. It's going to skyrocket, basically. Alex? So before we move on to how we negotiate with Microsoft remotely, and what we need to look out for. I want to just pause one minute and maybe um, any questions that you have on what we've covered up until now. It, it takes about uh, 30 seconds for the questions to come in because of the delays, various delays. So we say something, people start typing, we see that in the chat, like, 15 to 30 seconds late, unfortunately. So Okay, so in the meantime... Let's, let's bear with everybody. I hope everybody's uh, feeling uh, well, doing well today. We have we have good attendance uh, for, you know, it's it's almost it's almost the end of the training and uh, only the strongest survived. <laughs> so, but we have good attendance today. Uh, and, you know, I keep I keep telling everybody, if you if you came to the first and second part with the aim to uh, do the test, mm, you need to watch your aid. You won't be able to. We, we're going to have we're going to have questions about negotiations as well. So yeah, please pay attention. Uh, come back, watch again. 
I, I unfortunately this week I can't do the chapters tomorrow because tomorrow I'm in London for the inside day. If somebody, by the way, is in London and wants, wants to meet, meet up, uh, drop me a line on LinkedIn. We can just, you know, have a coffee. So, uh, <clears throat> uh, so I'll do this on Friday. Uh, so, so from Friday, we'll, we have, we will have all this chaptered. So then if you need to review a certain slide or anything that Daryl is talking about, you can just find it in the chapters and click that particular timestamp and quickly move on without, you know, trying to guess where mm -hmm. that was on the timeline. So we have all the other parts chapters as well. We're not, we're not, we're not getting any, uh, any comments coming, unfortunately. So, uh, so, this, so let's move this, on, Alex. We've got around 30 shame. minutes to go still. Yeah. So get yourself comfortable and let's talk about actually how you negotiate these days and what's the best approach with Microsoft. So basically there's, I would say remotely, if you're negotiating remotely, don't forget, negotiating remotely is not only voice or video, it's email. Email is key. So negotiations are usually a combination of email, voice calls, and video conferencing, and potentially it will come back face-to-face. -face. So we're not going to talk about face-to-face -to -face today. There's a lot of nuances there. That's a whole different session. But whatever we're talking about now is actually, you can take it to face-to-face -to -face and we can add on um, uh, non-verbal communication and uh, body language and building rapport and, and other communication skills that happy to discuss at a later stage. So, so let's talk about email. So email is really the first step in any negotiation process. And there are 12 rules that you need to just keep and be aware of when you're communicating with Microsoft. So first of all, be strategic and detailed oriented. You need to make sure that you, when you have a position, you need to make sure that you have, you're supporting it with benchmarks or standards. So there's something behind it. Potentially could even be your previous agreement or previous proposals, or maybe uh, you work for another company and that company got different terms and conditions. Use that as a benchmark. Try initially not to use attachments because if you use attachments, again, people don't open them. Uh, people are lazy. Your emails are forwarded sometimes without your attachment. So try and put whatever you can initially in the email and keep it well structured. Again, don't be argue, uh, don't argue, don't be nasty. Keep a very professional tone of voice. And if you get a nasty email, I like taking 24 hours to reply. So I don't sound angry when I do reply. Um, I'm looking at what's really important. Ah, this is key. Don't give away anything without getting something back. Even in an email negotiation, you're going back and forth. And Microsoft is asking, okay, please, um, um, I've got a small ask from you. Can you just add on uh, 25 uh, Power BI licenses to the contract? That will really help me. So you're not going to say, yes, of course, I want to help you. I'm a nice guy. No, <laughs> you're nice. Oh, I'll be very happy to help you out with the 25 Power BI licenses, but I would appreciate another 3% discount on my SQL Server licenses, and that's really crucial for my boss's boss or whatever. Ask for something in return. Don't give away anything without asking for something. Another thing, we're going to talk a bit about culture differences with uh, Microsoft as they are a US-based company, and that's time timing. So you need to just make sure that at the end of every email, and it really depends where you are in the world, you, you need to ask, okay, please reply until the 29th of the month. Or I would, I am expecting you to reply until this date. Otherwise, if you don't put a date and you're waiting there and you're not getting any reply and you're getting anxious, you don't know what's going on with the other side and you start dropping emails. The other side is going to understand that you're stressed out, that something's happening. And maybe there was no reason to stress out. But if you have a date, you can always, the date goes by, you can always come back and say, although we agreed for you to return, I have not heard back from you. You know, this puts the pressure on the other side. 
So, so please, please, please use timelines, use dates in your emails. So even in an email, you need to set an agenda. And now, especially with an EA, and we talked about the T minus 12 all the way to T minus three, if you're starting to talk to Microsoft three, four, five, six months prior to the agreement, you really need to watch out for, or not watch out, but prepare in advance and set in writing a very strict agenda. And that basically is, okay, my first communication is going to be, or first couple of communications are going to be by email. And then what are we going to be talking about? What do we want to achieve? What do you want to talk about? Do you want to introduce your team? What's going to be the schedule for the negotiations? What topics are going to be discussed? What's the priority of the topics? And when you come to an end of a um, meeting, who's going to take a summary of the meeting? And who's going to put it into writing? And who's going to take action items? So you need to really be clear on the agenda. If it's your responsibility, if it's Microsoft's responsibility, otherwise you're going to get lost in the communications. Now, when you have a multi-party uh, call, and we're moving now from email to actually having a multi-party multi uh, conversation, <coughs> you've got a number of um, priorities. One is, who are the members of your team? You need to have, make sure you've got legal. You need to make sure you've got your technical account manager internally, or your IT manager, I don't know who you deal with. Uh, if, it's, if you are procurement, then you need to have your um, software asset manager in the room. And then you have to set out roles and responsibilities. Who's going to play what game with Microsoft? You don't want anybody to say something out of scope. You want to prepare your team in advance. You want to be the one that's going to introduce everybody. It's going to be your responsibility to ask one of your team members to address a topic. You don't want everybody talking. You want to make sure that Microsoft doesn't bypass you, go over your head to your manager or manager's manager, or go behind your back to one of the technical professionals in the organization. You want to make sure nobody answers them. So you need to set up this, this whole um, team that you, that's going to be negotiating with you, with Microsoft. You need to bring them up to speed on what the objectives are, what's the negotiation plan, and what it's going to look like. Really, really important. So when you're on the phone having a conversation, this is the same for a voice call, for a uh, video conference, or for face-to-face. -face. These are some key uh, steps that I always recommend taking. One, introduce your team members. Listen actively what he said and how it is said. So this is communication skills. It's not only what said, it is how it is said and make note of it. Don't show excitement if there's a point that you wanted to get agreed was agreed upon. Be neutral. Don't commit too quickly. We spoke about that a minute ago in the emails. Don't commit. Oh, I need to review this. I want to think about it. I need somebody's approval. Don't commit. Silent is one of the strongest um, capabilities in any negotiation or any communication. People break down when there's silence in a room. Especially if the tones of the voice of, 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 of the conversation goes up and you go silent. The other side, 80% of the time will break the silence and they will lower the tone of the voice. And they will bring something to the table because they will feel uncomfortable. And of course, summarize verbally and follow up in writing. 
So these are just some basics we can, we can move on, Alex. This is really some basic tactics over the phone negotiations. I want to talk more about the differences between face-to-face -face negotiations and video conferencing. So basically, I would say the biggest thing that's, that's lost is the personal connection. And when you lose the personal connection, you can't build a, it's very difficult to build a relationship with the other side. And negotiation is about building a relationship. You need to know you're a Microsoft account manager. You want to know who the team is. You want to try and connect on a personal level. That will help you get what you want from the other side. So you need to be aware of that we're losing that um, 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 personal touch. In, a, in, 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 in addition, sorry, you want to make sure they see you. So don't sit, don't take out a chair. I'm going to show you how this looks. And this is how so many calls are done. People sit all the way down at the bottom like this. Their camera is completely out of focus. Let me get back. And they expect this to be a productive conversation. Or they stand up or they stand in the corner. I can go into, you've all been on Zoom for too long. It's just not professional. It's not going to get you where you want to go. Especially if you, if you have really bad video connection. If you have very bad sound. It's going to break down the negotiation process. So look out for that as well. And if you're going to be in a conference room and you've got multiple attendants, attendees on your side, just make sure where you seat them, everybody can be seen. Make sure that, sorry, everybody's dressed accordingly. This is not sitting at home in your uh, pajamas uh, or uh, sweatsuit. This is business. You want to conduct yourself like it was face to face. Show the respect to Microsoft that you would expect Microsoft to show you. So a Microsoft Enterprise Agreement or CSP negotiation with your reseller is highly, highly complex. There are so many details starting with the products and the licensing metrics, discounting, legal terms, uh, discounts, Azure benefits, pricing uh, um, payments, schedules, and on and on and on. You have to summarize this in an email. You don't wait to the last minute while everything has been spoken about and then try and aggregate everything and expect that everybody's going to agree to what was discussed. After each round of negotiations, please Send out a meeting summary. I'm not going to teach you how. You've got a framework here. Uh, but I really, really recommend every meeting, even if it's an email discussion, a phone discussion, video um, conference, send out a summary. It will save you so much problems and headaches and misunderstandings and cut down the negotiation time tremendously. So take this as a um, highly recommended action item on every single round of negotiations. Another aspect that's overlooked when negotiating with Microsoft is how culture plays a huge game. Now, Microsoft, don't forget, is an American corporation. So you might be sitting in India, in the Netherlands, in France, in Dubai, uh, in the UK, and you might be dealing or working with a local account manager and you can get confused you can get confused because you might think that you're dealing with the same culture that you used to but behind the scenes 
the Microsoft business culture is an American business culture. And that's how people are trained. And those local representatives that you're working with ultimately have American or maybe their boss's boss has somebody that works maybe in Europe or in the U.S. corporate headquarters in Seattle. So it's really important for you to keep that in mind because there are differences in the way American culture is compared to the way that you conduct your business. Now, it's very business culture or global culture is highly sophisticated and uh, intertwined. And we're not going to have enough time in the next 10 minutes or so to get into all the nuances for every single country, how each country is positioned against the US. So one, there are online tools that you can go on and you can use, but I want to just give you some um, basic points that you should just be aware of, keep in mind, and Next time you have a negotiation, it could be with Microsoft, it could be with any other vendor that's a multinational vendor. Just keep in mind culture differences and what to look out for. So let's go through the various, let's go back a second. Uh, sorry, um, Alex, go back a slide. So there are various areas that are impacted in business and in negotiations when you're looking at culture. One is the approval process. How do you build trust, <coughs> rapport? How do you voice opinions, schedule meetings, schedule um, um, uh, scheduling in general? When do you meet? How do you meet? What, what does time actually mean? The persuading, how do you persuade somebody that it's not, uh, that you're not thought of too aggressive or maybe too soft because there are nuances? How do you communicate? Feedback, how do you give feedback so the other side doesn't take it personally because there are countries that it's very forward-going, others that are, you need to be really nuanced, and of course, authority, who takes the decisions. So let's talk a bit about some of how you deal with Microsoft, please. So let's start with communications. So again, uh, number one cause of breakdown is communications. You need to address communication styles up front. That means that if you are negotiating and you are, for example, in uh, Australia, no, let's take India. Don't know why. Let's take India and the US. So there are differences in how you communicate. So what you need to first set out is, is a set of rules of how you communicate. Microsoft is very, um, very action item oriented. As a um, as a U.S. as a um, American corporate, everything is summarized in bullets with very clear action items. So you need to adjust yourself to that same type of communication. You might not be used to it in India. It's a different culture. Uh, if you say you're going to do something, you're going to do it. The Americans, if they don't hear back from you that you're actually doing it, they're going to get worried. So you need to watch out for that as well. Alex, just bring them all up, all six of them, please. Thank you. Uh, another thing is, yes, ask permission to summarize the meeting. I'm not going to go through all of them. There are so many. Uh, you can watch this afterwards. So ask permission. It's not obvious that you are taking the meeting summary. It is um, courtesy to ask, do you want me to send out? the meeting summary, or are you going to send out the meeting summary? So ask in advance. It's really important. Now, if it's really, if I'm going to the extreme, if your English isn't up to scale business-wise, that's fine. We all have our pros and cons. Don't try and hide behind emails, because that's what I've seen people do many times. And you're dealing with Americans. They're going to want to speak to you. It's okay to bring in a third party that's going to um, uh, communicate on your behalf. I've seen that before. It's better than trying to stand up to the same level of communication that the Americans have. You got, you're not going to meet that standard. 
you're going to feel uncomfortable. It's going to put you in a negative position negotiating. You are going to feel out of your comfort zone. So please, if that's the case, bring in a third party. Could be a, somebody in your team. It could be a translator. You decide. It will help the communication stage. Alex, just bring them all up. So on, on feedback, basically we've got, uh, Americans are very direct when it comes to feedback. Uh, so basically what you want to do, you want to provide, you don't want the feedback to be very layered, meaning uh, you don't want to be too sophisticated. If you want to say something, say it. If you want to ask for something, ask for it. Don't go around the bush like other countries do, like for example, the Chinese do, or other countries in the Middle East. You want something, ask for it. You're not sure about it, mirror the feedback. So if you hear something from your counterpart at Microsoft, then say, oh, I understood that. That's very acceptable. Some people, when they, when they um, use mirroring, they feel completely stupid, sorry because it sounds really stupid. Like I'm repeating what the person just said. Yes, repeat, say, I understood, or did I understand correctly from your last sentence that you are willing to approve? That's fine. That's the way the Americans communicate. Feel very comfortable to do that. Authority. So this is really key. Depending on where you are in the world, you might have to go up the approval ladder. Manager from to manager to manager to manager. It's a long process. Microsoft might not understand your approval culture. They might be expecting you to, to approve uh, the proposal within a couple of days. But if you don't communicate that this is going to take two, three weeks, and you've got three, four, five people that need to sign off on this, it could break down, first of all, your authority with, with them, and it can break down negotiations as well. And you need to be aware that Microsoft also has an approval process. They have business desk, they have specific empowerment holders. It goes up the chain of command, and that can take a while. So you need to be patient, and you need to be aware of how authority works, your authority internal and their, and their authority as well. Who takes decisions? So many times the people that you're negotiating with, and that's usually the case within Microsoft, are not the approval holders. They are facilitators of the uh, a negotiation. So you need to ask in advance, ask, just ask. It's not, you're not being rude. It's not out of scope. Please ask. Who is going to be approving my deal? If we go above this, what is the process? It's the same for identifying it within Microsoft and, of course, within your own organization. I don't need to tell you how to do business. So keep that in mind. Watch out for the approval process. There are multiple layers and ask in advance what that approval process looks like. Okay, so there's a word missing here. It's, it's um, building rapport, basically. So Americans are not very big on personal relationships. I don't know if there are a lot of Americans on the call today, but from a business perspective, it's business first. It's very business orientated. That's the culture. They hardly bring in their family, their weekend. They'll talk about 
sports events and and stuff like that but it's not very personal where with in countries in a, in many other countries it's very personal if you don't build up that personal relationship first there's no long term relationship so don't get don't expect too much from one on one hand so you're not disappointed and on the other hand don't get misled if you think that you're building up a personal relationship with them but ultimately once the deal's done it was just business as the americans say it's just business it's nothing personal but many of us me myself i i build up long term relationships i take things personally i try not to in business but it's still because that's my my background so keep that in mind as well don't get upset don't build your expectations so voicing opinions don't know what happened to this couple of slides something something went wrong voicing opinions <laughs> uh so uh, be 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 patient with the microsoft wait for their response use silence so we talked about silence as a communication uh, tactic use silence respect them from a business perspective always watch out for body language interpret body language be very even over video conferencing you can watch out for for body language uh it's pretty cool to watch out because you can learn a lot from that and uh be aware of insulting the other side so they might not understand your humor so don't if you're not sure how they're going to react to a joke or to you being very sophisticated you better just not say anything so watch out for that as well scheduling events so i know that there are countries where being on time means okay 5 minutes late or 10 minutes late that's being on time uh other countries coming in early is really important ending a meeting on time is crucial and if you don't end on time it's disrespectful for the other side americans are very punctual very punctual respect their time a time was set you start on time you end on time even if you haven't wrapped up everything if there's a process and there's a timeline set go back a second if there's a timeline and process set watch out and meet the timeline respect the timeline it's it will build trust trust is super important in this type of negotiation because you want them to work for you internally because you can't reach all the decision makers within microsoft so your representative is working on your behalf persuading so One of my recommendations is one don't use complex theories uh when you're trying to present your arguments don't make them too complex start off with what your actual requirements are give a benchmark for each request or one item why you are requesting it and then follow up with persuasive arguments not too long not too complex but straight to the point and then again repeat it again and again and again once you've set your requirements and you've built up your theory repeat that same thing again and again 10 15 20 times don't try anything else it the message will get through so that's really crucial when you're dealing with microsoft they will understand it
And we almost wrapped up. We 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 almost close to wrapping up. I want to just give you six takeaways dealing with Microsoft. One, don't be intimidated by Microsoft by their size. Don't be intimidated by deadlines. The only deadline that's intimidating is if your agreement ends on the last day of Microsoft's fiscal year, being the end of June. That's the only date that is a real deadline. Anything else can be prolonged. So if your EA is going to end 1st of November, you can prolong it for another 30 days. I've seen negotiations go on for 60 and 90 days after that. Of course, you need to have the right mindset, be really um, prepared and be large enough, but don't be intimidated. Don't let Microsoft go over your head. Microsoft is really, really powerfully uh, positioned within large organizations. They use their executives. They, they get their executives to phone into your executives behind your back. They don't, they don't care. They will do it. There's a saying with, uh, um, uh, that Americans use, and that's to throw somebody under the bus. Basically, find somebody as a scapegoat. Scapegoat. They will use it if needed. I'm sorry to say, I've seen it too many times. Too many times. They will go over the head, your head, go straight, straight to your executive that knows nothing about it, and he'll come down and tell you you're ruining the relationship. Why are you upsetting Microsoft? Don't let that happen. And if there are any LSPs and partners on this uh, present on this uh, live, again, nothing personal. LSPs are not your friends. They're not your friend. They live off Microsoft. They live off Microsoft. They need Microsoft more than they need you. Okay? And I'll say it again and again and again. For the last 20 years, I've been saying it. They are out to make a buck. And they've got Microsoft interest before your interest. <coughs> So watch out, deal with them as a business partner, but they're not your friend. Don't get a late start. As I said, T minus 12 months before, don't wait T minus three and start getting everything ready. You've already lost. You might reach and you'll sign an agreement, but you've lost. Don't let Microsoft take the lead. Meaning if they come with the Microsoft E5 proposal and you only want E3, You've lost. Don't let them put an E5 proposal on the table if you don't want to introduce E5 into your organization. And please, please, please don't share anything with Microsoft. Any raw data. Don't, don't just send them your map tool output or your data center output asking for their assistance. <laughs> You've got no idea what they'll find there, and they won't forget it. So those are my top six takeaways. If you don't remember anything else that I spoke about today, <laughs> take that. And I think, thank Alex, you. do I have any Dino, other slides? I much. think this is the last one, if I'm not mistaken. This is the last one, yes. Thank so, so thanks very much, everybody. Uh, I just wanted to remind you that the last uh, part of the training uh, is uh, 10th of November, two weeks from now. Uh, there's going to be about non-production environments and developer tools. A uh, very sensitive issue, actually. Don't don't underestimate it. Uh, huge headaches. And uh, I've been in, aud in an audit when uh, when an auditor completely overturned their first opinion, and then the bill rose overnight by forty million pounds, British pounds, because the auditor decided, no, that you know what, we're not going to treat that as a non-production environment. So I I'm going to talk about all this. Uh, how uh, how to assess if something is production non production, or uh, what are the pitfalls uh, which are often overlooked? As I said, this is this is one of those areas where uh, you know you may give it to your developers to play in their playground and think we can forget about that. We can forget it's sort of like a separate separate sandbox. It's not unless you really set it up as a separate sandbox, unless you really understand 
all the caveats and you closed all those loopholes. So please come to the training. And then after that, we'll, uh, we'll have an announcement about the test. So the test will not be on the 11th because we need time to prepare it. And, you know, there's a, there's a lot of work to just to do the presentations themselves. So uh, I don't really want to commit to anything exact right now, but I would say uh, expect the test to be somewhere end of November and we're going to run it for a month. So you'll have plenty of time to pass it. And uh, I think we're just following steps of redress compliance. We're going to give you three attempts, I hope. Uh, so you'll, you'll have time, you have plenty of time to uh, to do it before the new year. And then we'll close it, by the way. So uh, just, just a reminder, just a quick reminder about us. You can find us on LinkedIn. Some Expert is a company, international, global consulting agency with people in various countries and customers in over 30 countries. Uh, find us on LinkedIn if you if you like what we talk about here. We share a lot of knowledge. We we, we do we, we post almost on a daily basis. Uh, there's a community tab on on the YouTube channel. You can also if you become a member on the first of November, I'm going to do the first member only live, which will be just just, just a small club of people. And uh, if you can subscribe to this channel, if you if you like what we're doing here uh, and you feel like you want to subscribe. Of course, you're welcome. Of course, I'll be grateful if you subscribe to, to, to our channel and you know continue following what you know what, what we do, what we share, what we discuss. And uh, again, I, I, huge thanks to Daryl for, for his time and he, uh, because he's he's probably the busiest right now in some expert <laughs> at the moment. So uh, I, I do I do I do appreciate it very much, Daryl. Thank you. We have That's one question. Good. We have one question from from Jitendra. I'd like you to uh, take if you if you don't mind. Okay, so Jitendra, do you think we need to involve our legal law team while negotiating the contracts? Yes, definitely. There are so many privacy terms and conditions uh, within the contract, especially around um, cloud services and Office three sixty five services. Um, all kinds of penalties that Microsoft provide or don't provide around the contingency services, uptime, downtime. Yes, you need to get your a legal team, especially if you have your internal compliance issues and regulations in your country. You need them to sign off on them. And again, um, depending on the size of your organization, Jutenda, uh, it's possible to also get changes in Microsoft contracts. I know it sounds like no way have Mike, will Microsoft change any EA terms and conditions for us. Yes, again, depending on your size and market position, it's possible to do that. Thank you, Tyrell. Uh, thanks, Jatanda, for your question. So uh, if, you, if you have any questions left, so I, I I appreciate that you know asking asking you to write us an email maybe sometimes a bit too much to ask, but if there's anything you really want to discuss if there's a, if there are any pain points, just drop us a line at ask at somexpert dot com, and we'll come back to you as soon as possible. One of our leadership team uh, people, uh, it could be me, it could be Daryl, could be someone else, uh, it could be our American team. Uh, they will come back to you, and uh, obviously uh, you know. We can we can try and solve your solve your questions, uh, answer your questions, solve your issues. Thanks very much for being with us and safe with knowledge of licensing. Thank you, everybody. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.